Michelle Starkman, and I welcome you here to American Jewish University in one of our MAVEN programs. We're delighted to introduce and extend a warm welcome to Marin Hinkle, a renowned artist and esteemed professional as she joins us here today. Marin brings with her a wealth of talent, expertise, and a passion for her craft, making her an invaluable addition to our vibrant community of learners and creators. Marin is widely recognized for her exceptional performances on screen, captivating audiences with her nuanced portrayals of complex characters. From her remarkable, remarkable portrayal of Judith Harper Melnick on the TV hit series, Two and a Half Men, to her recent critically acclaimed role as Rose Wiseman in The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, Marin's talent knows no bound. Beyond her successful acting career, Marin's dedication to her craft is evident in her continuous pursuit of excellence. With extensive experience in the entertainment industry, she brings unique perspective that will undoubtedly enrich the knowledge and skills of all of our community members. Marin's portrayal of Rose Wiseman, a Jewish character, is nothing short of extraordinary. With her impeccable performance, she masterfully captures the essence of Rose's complex personality bringing depth, authenticity, and a deep understanding of Jewish culture to the screen. So welcome, Marin. Welcome to AJU and welcome to our Maven platform. Thank you. This is a complete pleasure to be here. I've been nervous and excited all day and connecting to people in my life from my past and um, you know, so thrilled that I can actually be here to have this time with you. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you. Our pleasure to have you. So we're just going to jump in. I have a whole bunch of questions for you, and I'm sure our audience is going to come up with questions. We encourage you to pop those in, and we'll do our best to get to them and to address them. So Rose Wiseman is this really fascinating and complex character. I personally have fallen in love with her. Tell us about the process. How did you land the role of Rose Wiseman? How did you approach becoming her? How did you enjoy playing her and portraying her? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, well, I think back to about six and a half years ago and I got a script for a pilot television series and it was um, an incredible read. And one of the reasons that I, I felt very um, excited and had some um, real confidence about going to the audition just because I thought I didn't have a shot at all at getting it because the description of the character was she enters the room in I think a satin dressing robe with uh, I think it had some kind of feather boa sort of around it as if in her own MGM musical and as many folks in my life who know me well will attest to I don't dress like that I am a pretty disheveled person I enter rooms sometimes with great nerves rather than a great sense of aplomb. Yeah. And so I felt like this woman is so far from me that I, you know, again, don't have a shot. So I went to, um, I live in Los Angeles and I went to a costume shop and took some robes there that I rented, took some wigs that I purchased and put it all together and decided I'm going to really just enjoy this. This is just going to be a game of playing. And I went to the audition. It was in the Valley. It was a hot day. I do you recall that? When <laughs> audition uh, with a wonderful friend of mine who's somebody I know distantly who was casting it named Jeannie Backrack gave the audition walked away tossed the script and said I will never hear again cut to about four months later I had been asked to fly to New York and back didn't get the role fly again to New York and back I think I did it at least two maybe three times and each time going in and taking all my dressing gowns and um, at the end of it I was told you get to play this woman I was so stunned it was one of the greatest sort of joys artistically that I've I've been offered and it was you know a, a great a great journey but um, that's how I kind of got from here to, to there. And that's a remarkable story that you really got to lean into the essence of Rose Weissman. And look, I, I, had been, yeah, I had been brought up with a great group of women in my life who had qualities of Rose. Yeah. And 
that's my mom. That's, um, I was a ballet dancer when I was young. My ballet sort of teachers and women who ran programs I did had that kind of fierce quality that she had and an incredibly important part of my life. And someone that I also see is very closely connected to Rose is my mother-in-law, Barbara Summer, who has been just a, a force for me and helping me understand this character. And so these were women in my life that sure. I hold so dear. So sort of through their help and just sort of like taking ideas of why they were important parts of my life, that was another part. Besides all the accoutrement that were on the external parts that I laid in, I really had to kind of go to the heart of who are the women that I most admire who are strong like this woman. And that's another part of who I used as my mentors, really. That's beautiful. And that sort of leads me to my next question, because Rose is very much a Jewish character, right? There's a lot of cultural and religious reference in the storyline. How did you research and get to understand Jewish culture and heritage to accurately depict her? I mean, did you draw upon your own background or experiences, or did you have any other personal connections or inspirations that helped you with the role? Well, yes, I grew up in Newton, Massachusetts, and I had um, probably I've been asking some of my friends about this, and I, I sometimes say, and perhaps it's a little exaggerated, that probably 90% of my friends were Jewish. I am not. And then someone said, well, it's probably a little bit closer to about like 80%. And then, and then maybe it was, you know, 75%. But the majority of my friends were, and as I was going through my teenage years and going to the bar mitzvahs and the bat mitzvahs, and I was really feeling like I needed community, as we all do as we grow up. I was really drawn to this, this religion and to this culture and to this group of family and friends that I was spending so much time with. And so one of my greatest friends, my best friends at the time, Diane, um, I think I said to her one day in about seventh grade, I, I really, you know, I don't know if I was thinking of converting, but I said, I really want to know more about Judaism. And like, I think it was the next day she brought in this whole slew of books for me to read. And it was it was that was sort of a beginning in my life of really not necessarily studying it the way maybe someone studies the Torah, but I didn't go as far, but I definitely wanted to understand more about Jewish life. And then after that, um, and there is actually a little funny story of having a lot of crushes on Jewish boys and one in particular, no names mentioned in case they're family. No, no, we don't want to do that. <laughs> And they, they feel like they've forgiven, you know, me for having a crush on their son or what have you, or maybe they've been okay, they'd be okay with me having a crush on their son. But they did tell this, this boy that he wasn't allowed to date me. And I remember I was like, co totally crushed by such a thing. But I did date a number of Jewish men and I did end up marrying one, Randall Summer and Randall um, and I, um, and I was mentioning his parents, um, yeah. you know, spent every Jewish holiday together with his folks in the Valley. And we, um, also had all of his relatives and family friends together. And then we have a son whose name is Ben and we raised him to, well, be open to all, but I think he would identify himself as being a Jewish young man. And in college, he's actually been spending time in the various Jewish organizations and has not gonna do, I don't think, joining a fraternity, but said that if were he to join one, it would definitely be the Jewish fraternity if they would take. But anyway, so those parts of my life were really significant and just the sense of being around um, this, this, just this way of being and thinking was something that I, I guess I was very drawn to. And as part of being Rose, I think I felt also a, a, a way in which I needed to talk to as many people as possible about their connections to being Jewish and also just about what was significant to these characters. So that's, I guess how I would, it's really, I mean, that's really quite beautiful that you have this amazing affinity towards the culture and the heritage, and it's kind of brought to life a little bit in Rose Weisman. Have you received any feedback from the Jewish community about how you've portrayed Rose on screen? I, 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 I hope that the people in my life um, who I used as inspiration have enjoyed or appreciated it. I know there has been talk. Um, at times about how, it, you know, is it a, a valid thing to have a non-Jewish person mm -hmm. playing a Jewish character? And there have been some articles, there's been some feedback I've read that was critical of 
you know, I don't know if it was specific to me, but that aspect of the show, I read something like the other day when I was looking at this kind of getting prepared for our interview that said, you know, I was a little annoyed at the over the top characters on the show. And then I realized that my own grandparents are over the top. So maybe I should be forgiving of it. Um, so sometimes those kind of contradictions are true too, is that people will say, that is too much. And yet to be honest, that reminds me so much of my own family, which are also a little bit too much. And, um, and so I have gotten a sense at times that, you know, there are parts of the show that I think people say uh, the creators get wrong. And then there are parts that people are saying, this reminds me so much of my own family. But I will say this, that I don't think Amy and Dan, Amy Sherman Palladino and her husband, Dan Palladino, were, were always looking for a verisimilitude. I think sometimes they've created spirits of characters that mean something to them. And it wasn't exactly specific to, um, you know, some particular person and it doesn't actually always have to read as completely accurate. It can have a little fantastical magical realism. And the show in, it, in itself is like a musical that way. It has this kind of quality that isn't always naturalistic, but can be a little bit grander than life. So that's, I guess what I would say is that if there are people that are critical of the show, I hope they can see and be forgiving and notice that it isn't supposed to always be completely perfect. Right. Well, we forget, we forget that it is part um, TV and movies are part fantasy, right? This is not a documentary. It's part of that fantastical creative process that gets brought in. And it seems like the show at times is choreographed, like a dance, the way the characters and the people move. Do you think that's that was part of the creative process? Or is that like very much just a 1950s, 60s connection that the creators pull together? Right. I think Amy and Dan are have been known in their past work as, as having rapid fire dialogue. And that was something as soon as I got the role that I was told right away, you're going to have to be like the most quick witted you've ever thought of even being. Yeah. I don't know in their past work if they had such a sense of that music and the dance to it, partially because it's such a theatrical piece with having, you know, stand up comedy performed on stages, with having this kind of time period, with having these gorgeous costumes and these sets. And so what they did that I loved, Amy herself was a ballet dancer and mm -hmm. then moved on into other kinds of dancing and, and is totally immersed and intrigued by musical theater. And I myself have a background in dance. And what I loved about the way they choreographed this show, and it really was choreography, is they had the people who are camera operators, they call them like steady cam operators. And what it is, is sometimes they put a camera on the body and it's worn, it's very heavy, but it's wow. worn in a way that, that person becomes a dancer in the choreography, in a sense. And so we do do rehearsal after rehearsal of how that cameraman or woman is, is making sure that they're getting this whole work that is, um, that is sort of perfectly in place. And once we've done it 10 to 15 to 20 times, then they let go and we actually have it as if we were doing a piece of dance. But that's really quite fascinating in terms of how it all comes to life. Bringing it back to Rose, she goes through various personal and cultural transformations during the season, right? How, um, how did you navigate those changes and ensure continuity in her identity, but also while allowing the character to evolve? Um, I, you know, I, I tried to take in as many historical pieces of film and literature as possible to get kind of an understanding of what was going on in the time. And all of the wonderful research that was being done for the costumes was, I mean, I loved spending hour upon hour to sort of figure out how were the shapes of what I wore, something that connected to how I was going to present myself in each scene. And then I also really just used what the dialogue was asking of the sense of a woman of that time that really values who she is within her family and sees that as the big definition of success. I mean, to her, Miriam is successful and utterly so as she starts because she is married with two children and that's all that is going to make up the, the happy family. And yes, she's very proud she went to college, but it's fine, we don't need to talk about that anymore. And I think that what I had to do, which was, which was wonderful was, and, and that's at the same time as what Rose was doing, is just become more and more open to what we were seeing as the years were progressing within the show and to see that you know Rose's judgment of what is correct as we know as time went on is just it was small-minded of her and she 
you know, look, I don't want to judge her. And for a while I was, you know, the very first episode of the first season, my character was, you know, claiming that her daughter, granddaughter was not going to be successful because of the way her forehead was too big. And there were other parts of her daughter's arms that perhaps weren't thin enough. And right. that kind of obsession, you know, physique of this, of these women around, I think as time went on, Rose let go of that kind of judgment. And she really right. saw she let go of the connection to her own family and taking in the family money. And as we find that her, she loses her apartment and has to move in with, you know, the Maisels. And we, we find that she herself realizes that what she thought was successful is, is not anymore what success necessarily means to her. And she took her own job herself and she found a way to make her own money. And there's an incredible yeah. scene that I find at the end of uh, season three, where my daughter was so angry at me for having gone to talk to her, her dear Benjamin. And basically she yells and screams, you've got to get your own life. You know, you can't do kind of like keep entering mine. And I take that criticism and I also sort of go on a little bit and, and sort of, you know, she's mad that I've been so critical of her as a stand-up. And I say, look, I don't understand what you're doing, putting us up on a stage, making fun of us. But what I do understand is the idea that you've had to create your own independent life. And then she, Rose says, and I myself know that never again will I be relying on a husband, on Abe, for, to make it, I, I'm going to only rely on myself. And that is, you know, not gonna depend on the whims of this man. I'm gonna have to leave, you know, yeah. take it on my. It's actually quite fascinating because as Midge, Maisel, her life transforms, so does her mother's. Right. And you know, sort of like this alignment in the transformation between mother and daughter. Were there any specific storylines? You just shared a few with us, but are there any other storylines or scenes that you think are particularly connected to that connection of family or Judaism or anything that you found um, particularly memorable or difficult as you encountered some of those topics and some of those ideas? Um, I, you know, I loved that, um, the sauciness that Rachel had and that Midge had is something that as time went on and I worked on the show and I would really kind of study how incredibly witty and intelligent my character was, I realized, you know, wait, I think that she gets that a lot from her mom. You, just as you said, I think that that as Rose was so, so judgmental and critical of her daughter, it would have been interesting had she been open to watching her do the stand-up, if she had said, you know, I think she's actually getting a lot of that humor from me. Just mm -hmm. as we had that great, I thought really exciting, crazy moment that was very meta where my character, Marin, is playing a character that's playing an actor that's playing another <laughs> character, and I had to get stand up that right. moment I loved so much because I think Rose in another life just as that character description that she enters as if in her own MGM musical I think that Rose fancies herself at the center of you know attention in the middle of a the theater and I love that she's critical of her daughter and doesn't see that she herself has kind of wanted that all along that's really fascinating that she perhaps missed and wanted a little bit of the spotlight right and now here her daughter is taking, taking it. And in that, she kind of learns that she can also do more and be more like the same way her daughter reinvented herself and became a stand up and took on a job and sort of evolved. So does Rose. She finds a career for herself as a matchmaker. And it has some real funny scenes and some real mm -hmm. liberation in that, that she becomes a career woman in and of herself. Do you think that um, that was reflective of the time or is this more like a modern concept that they were able to bring to the show that women could be, you know, it's not leave it to beaver. Women could be and do more than we think of them. I think that, that you know, what happens in the trajectory with Midge's character is quite appropriate to the time. I think that yeah. the idea that Rose kind of jumped ship and went back to Paris. I mean, she's a woman my age, she's in her fifties. And I, so I, and I would hope that I could do the same thing, just jump off and, and sort of redefine self in the middle of uh, having a middle a midlife crisis Rose was sort of having. Um, I, I think that Rose's kind of rediscovery of herself is particular, not necessarily to the time, but to the kind of 
really um, complicated and, and maybe big dreamer character that Amy and Dan created. Mm -hmm. But I say all that, right? As if I'm, my character of Rose was so not a, like, like others of the time. And then I say that thinking of my own mom or her mom before her, or many women that I know in my life who didn't work. And then at some point, once the children were off and my mom actually did it earlier is when I was young, younger, she went back and sure. went to law school. But a lot of women I know, once the kids were let go, sort of went around and said, I actually want something for myself in a new way. I want to grow yeah. my sort of intellectual understanding of things. I want to go back to school. I know we had that great scene that my character mm -hmm. goes back to Columbia and she goes backwards and forwards. She's learning so much and going to take art programs, but then she sits with a group of young women and says, you know, your focus should really be getting a husband. So I think there's both sides of Rose that are still kind of being played out where she doesn't, I remember asking Dan, wait, you had her go to Paris, you had her come home and you'd have her telling the women that? And he's like, that's life, isn't it? You take a few steps forward and a few back and you circle around and in that circle, you do sort of end up moving forward, but not necessarily in a straight line. And I feel that that, that was sort of appropriate in the way Amy and Dan wrote Rose. Yeah. I mean, it's really quite remarkable because I think that is what, what happens in life, right? We're pulled by tradition, what we're raised being, what we want to do, what we know we're capable of doing. And sometimes we can have it all, but just not quite at the same time. And, okay. and it seems like Rose represents that, right? She tries to find a way to have it all and reinvents herself in that space. And I think that's really quite beautiful to show that a woman of a certain age can reinvent herself, can move on from adversity and build a whole career for herself. Is there any um, specific message or impact that you hope your portrayal of Rose has on the representation of women or Jewish characters or women who are Jewish characters um, on in television? You know, I haven't thought about that question. Thank you. I will I will give it more thought, come back to you all. Yeah, and I heard what, but no, but I what I love, just as you were saying that question, I was thinking, you know, I'm so grateful that at this particular age, I had been told when I was younger that once you hit your 50s, um, you know, as an actress, unless you're lucky enough to be sort of the Meryl Streep, the Glenn Closes, or, you know, Helen Mirren's or Judy Dench's, that you don't have that many opportunities. And let me tell you, there are not that many opportunities. But what I was so fortunate to have a character that was more complicated, um, more contradictory. She was both uh, sort of brilliantly funny and also like at times sort of, sort of almost tragically sad and insecure too, mm -hmm. you know? and I. Every time we got a new script, they would show me something that was so different than what I had just done. And I hadn't had that many opportunities earlier in my career to play women that were so colorful. Um, and so maybe what I feel that this character hopefully has offered is a chance for people of this generation, of this age that she is, that I am, to I say, am <laughs> <laughs> you are too. I thought you were so much younger. But I thought, I think that, that she says to us, I hope, keep going, keep, keep cracking mm -hmm. open. Just on a personal level, I'm talking to you all from Spain. And part of the reason I'm enjoying this so much is all my years when I went to high school and undergraduate and then graduate school and then started right away a career and then wanted to get married and have the children is I never let myself actually really travel. I, mm. I, I really didn't do it. And people told me all the time, you know, do it, just take time off. But I just felt I had to keep focused. And I, I did feel a sand like little, you know, glass going down. And I guess that what's so joyous is maybe Rose's journey to Paris that year, which really and truthfully was, we got to go as actors to France. Maybe something cracked open in me that said, like, get out of what you feel is the comfort zone and try something unfamiliar. And hopefully part of what, you know, Midge does in this whole show and part of then what Rose also does and Susie's character, all the women really, Caroline Aaron's exquisite character of Shirley as well, just let go of what you think is the one way and see if you can keep open to many a way, you know. There's so, the show is so much 
richer than that one like storyline where you think about, okay, it's a, a woman newly divorced who becomes a stand-up comic, but you really address a lot of social issues of the day and of today, right? It, ha- it, it pulls forward to the 2020s. How did you adapt in confronting some of those issues? And I say social issues, I see that they're you know, marital dissatisfaction, gender roles, social status. Rose comes from a privileged background and there's a certain amount of wealth and her husband's a Columbia professor. And then it it comes kind of crashing down and they have to move in with the Maisels and move in with their daughter. How do you find um, navigating those dynamics in the development of the character and development of your role? Well, I'm just lucky that the writing was that good, honestly. It was, for me, speaking an open-hearted, you know, view of, like, I can't believe I get to say this. I mean, I, I remember at some point people kept asking if the character of Susie was gay, and I I didn't know, but I also was like, Amy and Dan will let this be what it's going to be, and mm-hmm. then when they sort of let that part of the storyline, I hope I'm not giving something completely away for those that haven't seen the last season, but so I'll actually maybe people haven't watched it, so I won't say too much, but just for me, it's not even so much, they created something so exquisite to like think about like what was what was that woman's background like in terms of her, yeah. her choice yeah. of love, but then what the true love story of the entire thing might be, one would argue, is a love story of those two women right, and not a sexual one, but between Ms. Midge and Susie, two people from such different walks of life, right, an Upper West Side kind of, you know, fancy woman that had it all in a marriage or seemed to, to a woman that, like, was working at a bar and, you know, yeah. didn't know what she was doing except, you know, booking talent or didn't even know she was going to get to do that, and I love that in the end of their lives, as we see at the end of the fifth season, they are, they have a lot that didn't work out in their lives. They're kind of lonely. They, there's an aching thing that's missing, but one thing that didn't seem to be missing, thank God, was that they had one another. So anyway, that didn't quite answer your question, I think, but it sort of goes to this idea that Amy and Dan constantly were surprising us by so many, I mean, look at Tony, maybe my favorite scene I happened upon that I'm going to share is I was walking through the lower east side and then I went over to I think the village and there were a group of trucks outside one day while we were shooting and that's one of the things I loved about um, being in New York is everything would always be like little magical things. And I said, hey, what show is shooting? And they said, oh, it's Maisel. And I went, oh my God. And I go downstairs to a basement and they're shooting the scene with Tony Shalhoub and the men, very my dinner with Andre in which they were all discussing at a restaurant, maybe the third to last episode, they were discussing as men, as male characters, what is it that they've been missing as these men? Right. That was such a culturally unique yeah. scene because yeah. I don't know how it really happened that men discussed that but to have Tony say I think I got it wrong it wasn't my grandson it wasn't my son that was the superstar intellect it was my daughter and then my right. very dick young daughter and that scene just gave me such chills to watch shooting that day as I happened upon it in the middle of New York just really didn't know that my own show was shooting that today and that man I was loving working with Mr. Tony Shalou for all those years he yeah. gave it a gentle like each time I saw the takes, it was like such perfection because it wasn't this big yeah. milestone, monumental discovery that makes you go bum, 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 bum. It just was like a, an epiphany and then moving right through it, you know? And it was so beautiful. And that's really the credit to the writing and then the, the acting of that particular, those group of actors. So what's really fascinating in this fifth season, which is the final season of the show, is that we jump into the future. Every episode kind of opens up jumping into future and sees what can be, what can happen, what happens to these, to these people as they grow older. And I absolutely love that because oftentimes you see, you jump into the past and you see the evolution of where they started, but I love the idea of seeing where they end. What What do you think was that process for Rose? We don't want to give it away, right? Everyone needs to go watch the fifth season. But do you see that she evolved further as as a person or did she embrace more in life? That scene, that scene, well, there's a couple of scenes, you're right, that are in the future, but one that was, was one of the hardest scenes I've ever had to shoot because... 
it asked me to kind of make up many, many, many years that I didn't have an answer to. And Amy yeah. was incredibly busy. And plus, I'm not sure that they necessarily, as, as the director, producer, and everything like geniuses, I'm not sure she necessarily wanted to tell me what her impression was. She was probably letting me come up with mine. And what I felt that was so hard was that there was a delicacy to Rose, like a true sense of her out of her own character because she had like lost her confidence. Now maybe she had because she was near death and she recognized her own fragility in a new way and was the ephemeral nature of humankind was in front of her in that moment. I don't, I don't know, but I do know that when I shot it, I kept kind of falling apart. Like I couldn't, and I don't mean breaking down in tears. It isn't, it wasn't exactly emotional. I couldn't like, I couldn't, it was one of the hardest things for me to say the words. Right. Um, and, and so I guess I, I don't quite have an answer to, to what it was like to play the future, but let's just say that being in the future isn't easy. <laughs> it's, it's not really like, it's the future for the show, but not the future for us because we've all lived through the 80s, right? <laughs> so. Right, but yes, exactly. It's the past exactly. from the world. Right. The future of this person that I had spent six years creating, and I hadn't given enough thought, I think, to who she would be in another 10 years. So all I can hope is that Amy gives me and Dan gives me more time to play more future of Rose at yeah. some point. Um, but I did think that like the sense of, her body not being as strong as it had been to her and her mind not being as strong and her sense of confidence not being as strong. I think that's part of the frailty of aging, isn't it? I certainly have found that in my 50 years as I, I used to be a kid that like walked into rooms and did say, look at me. And then as time went on, it became harder and harder, I think. And I became sometimes more and more um, self-erasing. And it's not right. something I'm proud of that was the hardest thing about playing Rose is that you I couldn't be that person I had to like embrace a kind of strength mm -hmm. but I will say that her as an older woman I think she was losing some of that strength the audience has been fantastic in terms of asking questions they are coming in fast and furious we encourage you to continue popping them in there you have a lot of fans. They absolutely love you and I see it here in the Q&A this is really 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 lovely. Um, and so, you know, some of these questions are really fantastic and interesting. I have one from the audience that says, how do you, yeah. this is, you know, this, this is a little bit on the controversial side, right? Cause you and I had this discussion about what it means to play a character that is not of your own background. So mm -hmm. how do you feel about much of the cast of Mrs. Maisel or some of the cast not being Jewish? And did you ever feel more of the main characters should have been played by Jewish actors. And maybe this is more a general question, you know, in terms of what's happening in Hollywood now. Yes, I, and I know this is like a, such a, a, a delicate question um, mm -hmm. and, and one that also many people in my profession have discussed sort of time and time again. I'll give you an example. Like for many years, I was able to play different sexualities, right? I could be heterosexual, I could be gay. Now I'm told often that I can't do that. I must only be closer to what I am. So similarly, when it comes to ethnicity or when it comes to a religious uh, connection, I am also being told at times now, again, may, maybe I wouldn't have gotten the role um, if it were being cast now rather than six mm -hmm. years ago, but I'm definitely being told now that one has to be uh, sort of more authentically the person that they are to play a role. The only reason, and Tony's given some great quotes and many of the other actors on my show are much more articulate about this than I can be. So forgive me that I'm gonna maybe be inarticulate and I also forgive me if I light a fire. But what I was gonna say is Tony talks about how his career has been mm -hmm. made up, I believe Lebanese, his career has been made up of playing Hispanic men and um, of Italian men and a very, uh, uh, you know, people that were, of very different kinds of backgrounds of, and of playing very different kinds of, as I said, sexualities of playing um, socioeconomic differences of playing people with all sorts of different accents. And had he known that he was only going to be able to play one person or one type of person, A, he would not have had a career, he says, and B, he's yeah. not as sure he would have been able to be an actor because why we all chose to be actors, most of us that I know, 
um, are because like when we were little kids, we liked playing as people other than ourselves. You know, I was the knight or the prince, or I was somebody that I didn't, you know, grow up in my town of Newton as. And so it's a little hard sometimes as an artist when you so want to be able to use your imagination and to historically dive into something and to do as much research as possible. It, it's hard to know that maybe you're not going to be able to do that anymore. On the other hand, I will say I have complete respect for varieties of um, uh, performers that haven't got to play people that they wanted to for whatever reason. And that is also a delicate issue there. So I, I sort of answered yeah. both sides. Yeah, no, no thank you for, I thank you for going there because I know it's a difficult, topic to address and it is it does tie into your training and I think we as audience members are curious and so I, I thank you for for going there with us and um, there were people in my graduate school class that were asked to take their their accents and yeah. um, I'm from Boston so I could have had a very you know hard R I could have said the pack in the car and I could have they were asked to shift their accent from where they came from and to be open to all sorts of different mm -hmm. accents and I remember some people really pushed back at that. And there was one person in particular that actually was like, I don't want to learn that language, that language, that good speech language. And then that person left and we all were like, oh, well, he'll never have a career. And within about a year, he was on Broadway and is a very famous actor. So that was not the case. But what I, what I will say about it is what I appreciated about our graduate school training was they were teaching us to do what I said Tony was saying is to have as much openness to playing as many kinds of mm. humans as walk this world and with the sense of empathy and understanding that we can hopefully have to the different kinds of people that again yeah, walk that's, this world. I mean, that's really quite beautiful and a testament to the quality education that you receive that you can put yourself out there in that way. We have an audience member here asking if you've ever disagreed with Rose's actions and, and how was it to process that between, you know, that tension between you and the character and the script and your writer and your creators? Oh, such a good question. And nobody's asked me this. That's fantastic. Um, and, I, and you know what? Because I was always worried about offending everybody, I, I, I didn't really speak about this too much. But for some reason today, I'm going to be brave. And um, maybe it's the Spanish air that's like wafting in from outside. I did not like that my character mm. judged people and their externals. Mm. And, and that is from that first episode. And part of that is because um, I am so sensitive to what how that felt when I was growing up to be told sure. anything about my physique. You know, it, it was it was deeply challenging, difficult, and led me into all sorts of unhappy and unhealthy places. So when I had to say stuff like that, the idea that my character became a matchmaker and was saying, well, this person isn't attractive enough for that person. And that I, I actually wanted to go to Amy and Dan and say, this isn't fair. You can't do this in this day and age. And I know their answer. It would be, well, it isn't this day and age. It's right. the other day and age. It's 1961. Right. So, and as my wonderful mother-in-law and I had a discussion about this today, there's a woman of a certain generation that was brought up with a kind of level of you know, as my character says, we, you know, you can, my character actually says something crazy, like we can, it's the head, you know, the forehead that I'm worried about, we can fix the nose, we can't fix the forehead, because right. her, her granddaughter was worried was having a too big forehead. Um, and I, you know, these are things that I really had a hard time with in how I was presenting them. But I, I recognize that of a different time, one has to be open to how someone else thinks. Sure, sure. So more, more to the fun stuff. What was your favorite Costume, <laughs> your rose, your favorite rose costume, because the clothing is absolutely fabulous, right? If anybody hasn't seen the show, it is phenomenal. It that that you know what that may have changed my life. I was also a person. I grew up in a um, back to Newton for a second. I grew up in a way in which you just sort of wore a simple pair of pants and a simple shirt. You don't have too many adornments, and you don't, you know. Even like these jewel, this jewelry is like almost like bigger than anything I'm used to. Um, but all of a sudden, with the way they were cl clothing me, I saw what happens when people wear things that are artistic, you know, that are really put together with color and right. the hat style, and beautiful coat, and we would have scarves that match the whole thing. And I really started to see the world in a, in a new way. So you asked me in my favorite costume, they sent me to Paris before we shot it. And I was in, I'm not going to speak, I don't really speak the language very well, but is it called like a, 
I'm not even going to, I'm not going to use my bad, my bad accent, but basically they brought me to a house that was like where they, an atelier maybe, or they, they yeah. made everything on me. And those costumes were to die for. They were like the beautiful, like baby blues. And that I, at one point I have something that feels very Jackie O where I say goodbye to France and I take the like hood and I put it over my hat and, and I do this merry melodramatic goodbye. But those costumes just really were exquisite. But then again, every, I don't think I had anything I didn't love. There's a costume I have that has a built-in cape. It's where Tony's has his cape and we go see a Broadway show. Right. That costume, I tried to, take and it's nowhere to be found and then finally I showed up somewhere and I think they're going to put it in some sort of museum or something and um you know so many of the costumes I fell in love with I probably I will never I, I can only see in some museum from here to from my words well, to the museum that's fantastic so we get to love them and go take a look at them sometime in the future because they are really quite quite fabulous are there any um specific roles you would love to play in the future I know this is so silly and cliche. I really love every, I find something in every role I get to play. So I just want to keep working. I'm not good when I don't work. See, that's the opposite of what I said about being overseas in Europe. I'm trying to learn to just embrace and how can one not embrace what this South of Spain is like. But I love meeting new people in a new group. And my son is off to college. And um, I feel like I need to just embrace community, like what I was saying about the value of religion. And I want to yeah. just keep working with communities of people that are exciting, um, artistic, inspired folks. So I don't have a, I'll do anything. You, you send me, you audience send me, or you Michelle send me whatever. <laughs> Where we would love to see you. So one of the audience members asks about the cast, because it seems like everyone's pretty tight knit on screen yeah. are you yeah. tight knit or close off screen as well are there like relationships that have formed that are just amazing opportunities and great bonds yeah people have gone through new relationships and new babies have been born and weddings have happened and it's one of the greatest things about doing a family show you know is that there were all different ages on that show right we had the youth we had the kids that were playing the grandchildren we have rachel and um Michael and that kind of generation. And then we have, you know, Moy, Shirley, Rose and Abe are a different, we're the older generation. And then they had all sorts of other wonderful groups that came on in. And we all just, we really did. We had family dinners. We had over Zoom um, during COVID, which was such a hard time. We all would get together and talk. So it is, I know probably in interviews, it makes it seem like we're really connected, but it isn't a seem seem. It is a real, real, <laughs> we really are that way. I'm missing them terribly. The woman who plays the other mom, Caroline, also has a, a child, also a boy named Ben. And so we always call each other, how's your Ben? How's your Ben? How are things going with <laughs> you, Ben? So, no. so have you found that a little bit of Rose has creeped into your everyday life, like your mannerisms, your expressions, your parenting style? Um, that you would have to ask my child if, <laughs> if it was coming in. <laughs> So yeah, actually, well, let me think. Um, that's that's funny. I'm like playing all the different sides of that. That what someone else yeah. might say this is. I don't think my friends would say I'm a better dresser. You'd have to ask them. Um, all my Newton friends are have always been the ones I turn to before I go to some of these events, and they give me the good advice on what to wear. So I that does not that's not that doesn't come from me. Um, but uh, let me think what I could have taken from her. She's not a great cook. I'm not a great cook, so that didn't work out. Um, let's see. Hmm. You know, back to what I said. She's she's a stronger woman than I am, and if if I hope to take something from her. I hope that I have a little bit more strength and sense of like courage in myself at times. It doesn't happen enough, but I hope I can take a little bit of Rose. Then. Is there any- and, you know what? and I will say this, the value of family gathering, which is what I learned so much growing up with my own family and what I continue to learn, particularly in connection to Judaism, I feel that the traditional life of having the holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, having our Hanukkah times together when the kids are all growing up and having all, all of it, it just, um, that was so deeply significant to me and such a big part of 
raising my son. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that in his time of growing up and then hopefully starting a family and moving it on, I hope that those kind of traditions that Rose had that I've learned to have, I hope that that will continue on in my future. But that is really quite beautiful. And thank you for, this is like almost a perfect little, as we wrap up, perfect piece to the end, because it seems like there's a love for Jude. You know, you were raised Jewish, but you definitely portray. I feel this love for Judaism and the tradition and the cultures and, and the culture and something that you've brought forward. And I think the audience has felt that today has really, I mean, the, the comments in here about Rose and you, and I mean, I'll send them to you afterwards because I think you would love to yeah. read them. What's next yeah. for, as we wrap up, tell us what's next for Marin Hinkle. I know you have some exciting projects in the wings. Share for us. And, and then we'll quickly we'll, we'll, we'll okay, wrap up. Uh, yes, I'll say that I am so lucky. I think this is okay to say. And if it's not, it's going to be said anyway. Um, uh -oh. uh, there's a wonderful uh, novel that came out a few years ago that's very autobiographical. It also has a little bit of fictional element. And um, it's written by Georgia Hunter. It's called uh, We Were the Lucky Ones. And it's, I'm not going to say too much because I want everybody to read it. Yeah, and I want to see the piece when it's put out for Hulu. Um, it's a eight episodes series on a family. I, again, I don't want to say too much, but it's on a family during the Holocaust. And that's what I'm yeah. working on. And that will be finished up very, very shortly. And hopefully will air um, within the year, I hope, or, you know, within a year. So that's what I am lucky enough to be working on. And that, that by the way, has brought me, which is so extraordinary. I went to visit Romania and worked there and went to Spain. So that's one of the blessings also of being an actor is that I got to travel to a new part of the world. I love that. And I hope for you that you always find great characters to portray. I can't wait to watch and see what else. I'm going to have to go back and watch some of your prior work that I haven't had an opportunity to, to catch up on. And I encourage the audience to do the same. As we wrap up today, I want to thank you so from the bottom of my heart and from AJU, Marin Hinkle, for joining us today. It's been such a pleasure and such a joy to get to know you and to speak with you. Thank you, Marin, and thank you to the audience. Thank you.